Okay, here we are. So I think you can see my screen. So I will start with the solution. So maybe let me first open the assignment. I should have done this first. Uh, I will go to uh, masterclass. Then the assignment is here. Okay, so uh, the, as we discussed last time, so to do this exercise, you might try to compile Plumed on your own. And uh, indeed, that's what I did here. And uh, yeah, to, to be sincere, the reason why I, I recompile Plumed is that I realized that Plumed and um, more specifically Gromax actually is way, way slower if it's compiled. If you use the Conda version of Gromax, it's significantly slower than the one that you can compile directly on your machine. So the timings were a bit depressing. And so I decided to uh, recompile uh, both uh, Gromax and Plumed, but uh, I, I just used the, the, these versions listed here, 2.7 and, and 2019 for Gromax. Uh, okay, good. So. First exercise, I will correct this and then I will uh, I will let the stage to uh, Max for the second exercise. So uh, the first exercise is just uh, uh, binding and unbinding of two ions in water. And uh, you were supposed to start uh, with this input file and then uh, try to find a way to make it run faster. So let me go to the solution notebook. I already uploaded this on, on the web, so on GitHub, so you should be able to find it there. And even to, you can also download it now if you prefer, or you can follow me here. I mean, maybe I will change the font here. Okay, great. Unfortunately, this is not the interactive notebook because I run it on my workstation. And now uh, I cannot connect to it uh, with VPN, otherwise it doesn't work well with, with Zoom. So I will not be able to run other commands here, but uh, uh, hopefully I can yeah, at least show you what I did and uh, uh, discuss your comments. Uh, okay, this is as I did uh, in some previous exercise, I have some tool to run commands and then I wrote this simple script that just uh, extracts the final part of the MD log file so that uh, I can use it to monitor performances basically and to see them in the notebooks. So, and here, this is just to check that my executables are working correctly. And uh, yeah, that, that's just where I installed Plumen on my machine. So it's not so important. You can do it in many different ways. So this is compiled using an Intel compiler and uh, CUDA as well. So these simulations are done, including the GPU. This is, this is a kind of old workstation, is maybe six or seven years old. It has 12 physical cores uh, with the possibility to have 24 threads, up to 24 threads with hybrid threading and a gaming GPU that I bought when I bought the workstation. Okay, good. So first exercise, so we will first try to optimize the settings for the meta D action. So this is the input file that I took from the tutorial. And here I was running it just for a few thousand steps uh, just to see the performance. And then with this script, I can extract the final part of the input file. Let me make it wider so that, okay, we can see all the columns. Great. So. Uh, you see with these settings, it's the, the provided input file. We run at 160 nanoseconds per day. Uh, and this is the breakdown of the performance of the uh, computational cost for each of the uh, of the comments in the Plumer input file, as, as, you have seen, as, as we have seen last time. So you see that the most expensive part is the calculation of this coordination number. And uh, this is to have an idea of the observed range of variables. I'm just showing the value of the distance observed in the simulation. It's in this range. And the value of, value of the coordination number, it's in this range here. So I initially did this to have an idea of which would have been 
a reasonable boundary for a grid. You have seen, I think, already with Max uh, that uh, it's um, useful to use a grid when you run metadynamics. Uh, and uh, the point is, especially as your simulation becomes longer, because if you don't use a grid, what will happen is that at every iteration, the uh, the code will have to make a loop over all the deposited hills. So basically the cost, the simulation will become slower and slower as the number of deposited hills grows. That's very inefficient. Uh, but typically you don't see this at the beginning of the simulation. So uh, yeah, maybe this test is not very significant. I was lazy. Maybe the, the best way to do a test like this one is to try with a restart with many hills so that you can really see that uh, without using grid, it's slow. Uh, but still, I know that this should be done, so I, I decided to do it anyway. So uh, I set up my grid here. Uh, I use values that you see one is ranging between 0 and 4, one between uh, 4 and 8. Uh, it's exaggerated with respect to the ranges uh, explored here. So what uh, happens in practice uh, is that uh, if the simulation goes out of these boundaries, it stops. And so, uh, yeah, you have to choose them carefully and maybe exaggerate a bit to avoid being surprised that uh, the simulation that uh, was maybe in the queue in the cluster for one week uh, then crashed because of a mistake here. Can I, add a, can I add a comment, Giovanni? Yeah, of course. Because often they ask, uh, how can I choose the dimension of the grid? For some collective variables, the definition itself of a collective variable gives you gives you the minimum and maximum values that the variable can assume. For example, a sum of cosines over the dihedrals, or in this case, the coordination between a group of atoms. By, by the, looking at the dimension of group A and group B, you can uh, already tell what is the minimum va uh, value that this variable can assume or the maximum value variable. For, for, for many CVs, you can know a priori. Sorry. Uh, yeah, th thanks, Max. Actually, a uh, further comment is that uh, if variables have a fixed range, like the hydral angles, I think uh, if I remember correctly, whatever you put here will be uh, overridden by the correct range, which is minus pi, pi, uh, or maybe you will receive an error. I don't remember now. Anyway, you should use that range. Uh, what Max said about coordination is true. On the other hand, in this specific case, so the second group uh, is made of a few thousand atoms, but clearly it's not possible that all the water oxygens are in contact with the uh, sodium ion here. So clearly you need to know something to have an order of magnitude. And uh, here the, yeah, you see that in this preliminary run, it explores more or less this range. So. I think the truth is that uh, is that I tried with a narrower range, and then in one of the later tests I received a mistake, and then I went back and run it again. Usually, it's not too difficult. Another parameter that uh, sometimes you find in input files is the pace of the grid. I would recommend not even to put it because uh, it's chosen automatically based on the value of sigma, and uh, and so. Uh, you, you should tweak with that only if you are really in extreme cases where uh, your grid has too many points that do not fit in the memory. And so you want to try to make it coarser, but uh, there is some risk in doing that. So don't do it unless you know exactly what you're doing. Uh, okay, let's look at the performance. It's actually even worse than before. It's 154. You can also try to look at the individual steps. So. Let's see, for instance, the calculation of metadynamics. Metadynamics, I didn't give it a name, so, but it's action number seven here. So here it was 0 0.1. Let's see how much is it here. It's 0 0.07. So you see that uh, this calculation became a bit faster. Uh, it's not so important here, and indeed it doesn't lead to any advantage but it uh, will lead to a very big advantage when your simulation becomes uh, longer and you have uh, a few hundreds or even thousands of Gaussians accumulated. So definitely you should use grids. Uh, okay, so uh, I, I think, again, I don't think this test is convincing you that it's a good idea to use grids, but believe me, it is a good idea to use grids. 
Another thing that uh, we can realize here is that the pace was set to something very small. It was, uh, pace was 10 and, and height was very low, like 0 0.1. This is 0 0.1 kJ per mole. So it's a very small fraction of kBP. So usually it's not uh, uh, necessary to have hills that are much, much smaller than kBT. So a fraction of kBT is, is okay, usually. Uh, and so these hills uh, here are too small. It's not a problem, but clearly we can obtain a similar result by increasing pace and height simultaneously. So for instance, if I multiply pace by 10 and height by 10, I expect to obtain a very similar trajectory. Uh, what happens here indeed is that on the long run, the height of the hills is going to decrease eventually. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so the, as you decrease them, because you multiply them by this factor that uh, is part of the well-tempered metronomics formalism, the height will become much smaller than this. And uh, only the rate between these two numbers will, will matter in the end. So it, it's totally fine to just uh, change one of them and by changing also the other by the same factor. And uh, when I do this, there is a little gain. And uh, I think this is due to the fact that I update my grid the potential less often. It's not a big uh, impact actually. And uh, I, I, I'm not sure it's really significant, but uh, anyway, let, let's keep the input like this one for the next uh, points. So this was the first uh, point. So any comment on this? Any of you who managed to do this or try to do it in different way? Maybe Oliver was the one doing it. So if you want to say something. Uh, yeah, I think I got a similar result, but I just multiplied by a smaller factor than, than both of oh. them, so. Okay, it's fine. Yeah, I've seen that the impact is not so much here. So probably it's not so useful, this optimization in this case. And maybe it, could, it would matter more if you have a three-dimensional grid, because in that case, the cost of adding hills will be larger. And there was another comment, maybe? Yes, no, I also did it. And by chance, in my case, or in my computer, uh, adding the grid help. But uh, I think it's by chance. Uh, in this case, in this small example, if you are in a real application, uh, and I did it in the past, if when you add a grid, you see that you have a, a, significant, a significant improvement of the performance. Yeah, yeah. Also in this application, you will get a significant improvement, but you have to run it longer. The point is that it's not that the, that the system is simple. The point is that this simulation is too short to see the effect. Okay. So uh, it, maybe you did your test with a larger number of steps. That's why on your machine, you have seen the effect of uh, grids. Uh, yes, sure. And it, it totally makes sense that uh, for a longer simulation, you should, should see it. We, we will see in the, in the second exercise what happens when you restart with uh, 100, 200,000 uh, Gaussian with or without grid, uh, what is the impact? And it's traumatic. You will see it in uh, 30 minutes or so. Yeah, Max did it in the right uh, way to explain you, whereas what I did is I, I just did it uh, as I know it should be done, but uh, yeah, maybe it's not very convincing. You will be convinced by Max. Okay, good. So other comments on the first point, otherwise I will go to the second one. So the first point was optimizing the calculation of this metadynamics action. The second point will be optimize the calculation of the coordination number that you see it's actually the most expensive part uh, in, in, in the zoomed calculation. Okay, so uh, in order to optimize this the calculation of these coordination variables, uh, the, the most efficient thing that you can do is to use neighbor lists. You have to, however, be very careful when you use neighbor lists because it's very easy to do mistakes. Unfortunately, we don't have any automatic way to set the parameters, so you really have to do careful checks. So the first thing that you should do uh, so the, 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 the goal here is to have uh, an alternative way to evaluate a variable that is identical to what uh, you would obtain without using neighbor lists. So the coordination 
number as we defined it so far with this definition here cannot be computed with neighbor list formally because it's a long range. So this coordination number is a switching function that is different from zero, even if you go at very large distance. So there's no way to say that uh, water molecules that are far from the ion do not uh, matter in this calculation. So the first thing that you have to do is to modify this function and make it uh, shorter ranged. So to do so, you should set this dmax variable here. That basically uh, what it does is it says that uh, any pairs at a distance larger than this will contribute exactly zero to the coordination number. So uh, here I made the test using different values of the max. So you see, I'm not changing R0. Changing R0 would change the definition of the variable significantly. Changing the max hopefully doesn't, provided that, this, that the max is, uh, uh, is significantly larger than uh, R0. And then everything else uh, should be the same as, as before. And then here I write a new file called test where I print my reference coordination number, the one computed without the max. And then I tried here four different choices with the uh, growing variable value of, of the max. And uh, clearly now this calculation is not any more significant for uh, timing because I'm computing coordination many times. But I can check at the timing of uh, each of these lines. So what I, what I expect is that, uh, OK, actually, here there is no neighbor list, so they, they should still cost more or less the same. So let's see what happens. So the performance you see is poorer, but that's just because I'm, uh, I'm, um, uh, I'm computing the coordination number more than once. So. So timings are comparable. Actually, it's slightly faster than without using this Dmax. Uh, I think this is happening because uh, what Tuma does is first it compares the distance with the cutoff, the max here. And if it's larger, it stops there. If it's smaller, it does some further calculation. And so this allows for a little saving, but that's not really the critical saving now. Uh, the, the thing that we want to see here is not the difference in performance that uh, is very small, but the thing that we want to see is the difference in the value of the calculated coordination number. So uh, I'm reading this test file here and uh, plotting it. I'm just plotting here in the horizontal axis, I have the true coordination number, the one computed with the original definition, this one. CN. And then with four different colors, I have uh, the approximate version with uh, any uh, increasing value of uh, uh, Dmax. So the blue one is the first one, is the one with the smallest value of Dmax. Okay, so what I see here is that uh, basically these lines, these are parallel lines. So if one variable, if one of the definitions is increasing by one, also the other definition is increasing by one, you can obtain all of them by a rigid shift. Why, why is this happening? So what happens here is that uh, basically, uh, the, clearly there is some approximation in this, uh, when you apply this cutoff. And when you apply this cutoff, you are not counting the contribution coming from uh, water molecules that are far from the ion. But their contribution is more or less always the same. And so it's not so important. Plus, it is small. And so it's, it's again, not so important. It, it's basically a rigid shift. Uh, what's important here is the, this big change between five and, and seven here that tells you that something is changing in the first coordination shell. And that's properly described by all the versions of this coordination number. Clearly, a posteriori, if you are interested in computing, for instance, the free energy as a function of the coordination number defined without the max, you can do it with the weighting. But uh, for the purpose of uh, doing a bias simulation, you don't need to compute uh, the coordination number exactly. It's fine to have this approximate version that, uh, uh, that uh, is basically equal to the original one minus uh, rigid shift. Does it make sense? 
Any comment on this? So there is an, an, another important thing that uh, maybe I should have uh, written here, but you can find it in the manual. Uh, when we apply this cutoff, uh, we don't have, a, we don't, uh, uh, so our definition of the switching function is still continuous. There's not a jump in the, in the switching function. Having a jump in the switching function would be very dangerous because then the derivative would be infinite in one point and you would not be able to correctly compute uh, free energy changes through that variable. So we need to make sure that our variable is defined in a continuous manner. And uh, uh, it is irrespective of the value of the max. So if you choose it very small, basically there will be some reshaping of the function that you can see in the, it's explained in the manual that will make it uh, continuous. So any comment? Giovanni. Yeah. Uh, the, my question is uh, this, what you said about the collective value to be approximated in order to make the bias. Uh, it, this is valid for every or each collective value uh, uh, I choose. Yeah, so in general, so one problem that you have when you when you want to use an asset sampling methods is that you typically need to compute your collective variables at every step. Max will show you how to compute them maybe every second step. But uh, clearly, you have to compute them very frequently. Whereas typically for analysis, you compute them rarely, let's say every 100 steps, 1000 steps. So it's actually a very good trick to use an approximate way to compute your collective variable at every step for biasing, and maybe a better way for analysis uh, with, a, with a larger stride. Okay, let's say it's a, it's a common strategy. And if you want, this is the simplest possible example of using that strategy. You could uh, really have uh, use it, you, you could push it further and say, I don't know, you want to compute the, the gyration radius of a molecule, you approximate it using only a few atoms, and then you recompute it using all the atoms. Or you want to compute RMST, you use it uh, with a few atoms, and then include more atoms in the analysis. You, you can do a lot of stuff. Uh, Okay, good. So uh, now we are happy with the, uh, we see that all, all of them, they work basically. So I will pick the smallest value 0 0.75 because now I have to, now I will add the enable list. So now, uh, so you see this first step was done with through an approximation. I wanted just to make sure that this approximation is not affecting too much the forces that I will add, add to my system. So. These lines are parallel. Now I will uh, uh, I will add the neighbor list, and I want to do it without making any approximation. I want to obtain exactly the same result that I was obtaining without the neighbor list. So I will now take as a reference the coordination computed using my d max equal to zero point seventy five, and then I have many variants of the coordination again in the same input file computed with neighbor list with different cutoffs for the neighbor list and different stride for the neighbor list. So the different cutoff tells how many pairs are included in the calculation of the neighbor list. The different stride tells how frequently are we recomputing the neighbor list. Uh, I decided to do it in a grid in this way, but clearly you can if you have more time to spend on this, you can do it better. You can do finer grids and try to be more accurate in this estimation. So uh, I tried basically two values for the cutoff. Uh, they should be larger than the max because if they are equal to the max, uh, basically you will, uh, you will lose some pairs in, in, the, in the counting. And the, the larger they are with respect to the max, the larger the stride you will be able to use without introducing mistakes. So then I, will, I tried an array of strides. So this is stride 200 means that basically I'm going to, uh, every 200 steps, I'm going to decide who are the water molecules that are neighbors of the sodium ion based on a cutoff of uh, eight angstrom or 10 angstrom in this case. And, that's the, and then at every calculation, only 
water molecules that are within 7.5 angstrom will actually matter. Okay, uh, again, the performance here is not so important, the overall performance, but we can compare the performance of each individual variable. You see the most expensive implementation is the, the full one. But you see that even with a small stride, with a stride five, we have a significant gain. Here it's a factor seven, more or less. And then, okay, maybe the numbering of these variables was not so, is not so happy. So coordination number seven is the one with the shortest stride and cutoff one. Seven is this one. So clearly you see that the performance is improving as you increase the stride. But then if you use the larger cutoff, it becomes worse because basically you are including more putative neighbors for your sodium, so you are ex, sorry, myon, so you are exploiting uh, less the, the advantage of the neighbor list. Okay, so now we will have this six, this group of six ways to compute the coordination with the increasing stride, and then other six ways to compute the coordination with the increasing strides. And, and I will compare the value. And again, I, I just write them on a file called test. And I read it here. They have a table. If you look at the table, it looks like all the columns are identical, but clearly you should not only check this. You can should check this for every single frame in your simulation. And here you see I'm plotting the difference with respect to the reference coordination number. So it's like the approximate coordination number minus the reference one. You see the difference is always negative. Why? Because my switching function is always positive. And when I do a mistake, because uh, the neighbor list was not up to date, potential energy function will be non-conservative. It's like having a jump in the definition of the energy. So I really do not want this to happen. And so I will make sure that uh, this is exactly zero. So this is the first six with the cutoff 0.8. And this is the second group with cutoff uh, one, 1.0. So here what I picked for the next runs is coordination number two. So here I'm plotting also the standard deviation of this line just to make sure that it's always zero. And uh, I picked the definition number two uh, with the definition number two, uh, which is this one. So cut off 0 0.8 uh, uh, and then stride equal to 10. And the reason for this choice is that uh, all the implementations with the uh, cut off equal to one were slower. And uh, if we were using a larger stride, I was obtaining some time even very rarely, but I don't care, some missing pairs. So I wanted to make sure that uh, I'm including all pairs in the calculation. And then you see also that, the, so this was CN2 that I'm picking, picking this one. So you see it's like 10 times faster than the original variant. And the advantage of uh, increasing even more the, the stride is not so much. So I think it's not worth the risk. Okay, whereas all these cases here were slower. I would say one of these would have been probably a good, very good choice anyway. Okay, any comment on this? Any of you managed to do this or, try, or maybe obtain different parameters? No comment. Uh, so how many of you managed to try different values for coordination? Sorry, for the different values for the, for the neighbor these parameters. Okay, nobody. Okay, now hopefully looking at this, you, you should know how to do it. Uh, but you will see in point 1D that uh, uh, actually, this was not so useful. Okay, next point, optimizing the number of cores. This is very much depending Excuse on- Excuse me. Ah, yes. So the rational switching function that is being used here. Yeah. The function 
by definition has a point at which uh, it is undefined right suppose uh, at points where r i j minus d is equal to r not the rational switching function uh, by definition becomes uh, undefined i i have always wondered how uh, plume takes care of it okay good <clears throat> so uh, there, there's one thing that uh, i think uh, is uh, originating from a very misleading notation that has been used traditionally for these switching functions let me search the manual yes so you see that here uh, so uh, can, can you see my screen i think you, you can see this expression this is the, the expression you are referring to right so you have yes, yes. Uh, that this is not well defined when uh, okay let's say d zero is equal to one when r is equal to r zero this is not well defined actually if you choose m equal to six and m equal to twelve mm -hmm. or uh, in any case if you choose that m is equal to twice n this can be simplified and let me see if we wrote it somewhere uh, not here in the manual but this can be simplified to one divided by one plus R divided by R zero to the sixth power. Okay, so that's what Plumet does. If M is equal to twice M, it's actually faster okay. to directly compute one divided by one plus R divided by R zero to the sixth power. Okay, the, the reason to do this is, is not just to avoid the discontinuity, but is to make the calculation faster first. Uh, then if you choose M different from twice N, Plumet will take, uh, I think, a Taylor expansion in the... So if R is too close to R0, it will take the limit correctly by a Taylor expansion. Okay. okay. But for the, for the... Most people are then using the default parameters, which are n equal to 6 and m equal to 12, which means that uh, the functional form implemented is not this one. It's 1 divided by 1 plus R divided by R0 to the sixth power. Okay, uh, I have a follow-up question if I may ask. Yeah. I have used uh, switching functions before to calculate the number of hydrogen bonds as a, I have used number of hydrogen bonds as a collective variable. Yeah. And uh, always uh, the, there used to be uh, issues coming with the angle part of the definition of number of hydrogen bonds. So I used, there, there's, there's a switching function on the donor acceptor distance and there's a switching function on the donor hydrogen acceptor angle. The distance uh, functions never created any issues, but the angle switching functions always did. I couldn't really figure out uh, what exactly was going wrong with the angle definition there. Just in case uh, you have any experience. Uh, yeah. Uh, I never tried, so, so but did you use Bloom to do that calculation or? Yes, yes, yes. Bloom switching functions only. Uh, yeah, I think that with Plume, there is no easy way to have this definition with angles, or maybe there is, and I don't know. Okay. Maybe the problem is then the periodicity of, of angle. When you take the, you, you need to make a difference of two, of two angles, right? In the switching function for no, the, no, that. No, that's not no. a, a dihedral angle. It's just a, a normal angle. So it's an arc cosine of a scalar oh, okay. product. So it's not periodic. Then I don't remember how to, how it is implemented, uh, if it's possible to do it in Plumed. But in principle, it is possible to have a switching function. Maybe I would do the product of a switching function for the distance multiplied by another switching function for the angles. And then yeah. I would sum over all the uh, triplets of atoms that uh, are involved. But I don't think you can do this with coordination. You should use maybe some other feature in Plumed or code it by hand. Yes, yes. Uh, the number of hydrogen bonds are calculated the way you just mentioned. So, but uh, the simulation used to crash all the time. Uh, and uh, whenever I tried to debug, I always found out that the issue come, was coming from the angle part of the... Uh, yeah. It's possible that the, that the switching function was too steep, maybe. Okay. It could be. And then I'm also not completely sure that it's a good idea to use angle and distance. Uh, because uh, the, um, the problem is that uh, uh, 
But of course, it depends on the parameters of the function for the distance. The problem that I can imagine is that uh, the, uh, the effect of the distance, so the, the, the distance depends in the position in a way that is the angle depends on the position in a way that is different depending on the distance. So it might be that for short distances, the angle changes too quickly with respect to the position. And so you have to be a bit careful with choosing the, the parameters. Maybe one has to play a bit with the parameters for the switching function for the angles, but I have no practical experience with that. Okay, okay, sure. I'm just Thanks guessing. Uh, okay, good. So good. So now here I chose the definition number two, cut off 0 0.8 and strike 10. That's what is used here. Okay, then try to optimize for the number of cores. This is very much uh, depending on the machine. Uh, and I'm just here showing three attempts that make sense on my machine. As I said, is 12 cores, 24 threads with hyper threading. Uh, so I tried uh, uh, 12 threads uh, with only OpenMP and I get uh, 160 nanoseconds per day. And then I tried uh, six threads times the two processes. So it's the same amount of uh, cores that I'm using, uh, but uh, this is going to use a, a hybrid parallelization. So uh, it has MPI and OpenMP parallelization. It doesn't work well. It goes down to 120. And I, I always had this, this experience with, uh, with Gromax on, on my machine. So I actually knew that, that typically on a single machine, when possible, it's always convenient to use uh, OpenMP instead of using a hybrid parallelism. Clearly, this is also because my machine does not have too many cores. Maybe if you have a machine with a lot of cores, it would be convenient to use a hybrid parallelism. And it's because my machine has a single GPU. So uh, it's not uh, uh, maybe very efficient in uh, using uh, two processes. So this could be very, very dependent on the machine that you are using. So you really need to experiment. I also tried to use 24 threads, hoping to exploit hyper threading. No, no, it, it becomes uh, even slower. So it's not uh, really, really useful. So yeah, the, the setting that uh, I was using at the beginning, that is the standard setting that I always use on my machine is probably the best one. I, I didn't try like other possibilities here. Uh, okay, comments, does it make sense? Just one uh, question. Yeah. So basically to, to optimize the performance, to find the optimal performance, is uh, the only thing we can do is this try and an error with several uh, values of the, so changing the configuration of the number of threads and so on. Uh, there is no like a, an optimal way to say this may be the best configuration, just do it in bad try and an error. No, I would say, I would suggest to do trial and error because it's too complicated to predict. Clearly, if you, um, if you have experience, uh, you can, uh, do some guided trial and error. For instance, if your system is very small, probably it will not scale well. Uh, if your system is, so, so it will be maybe not even convenient to use a lot of, uh, of processes. Uh, if your system is not dense, for instance, if you have a, a, a Go model, like the one that you will use later, uh, I don't know, maybe using domain decomposition is not so efficient. I don't know, maybe Max uh, uh, has done some tests on it, uh, so he will comment. No, so, actually, not, not really, I played a little bit, and, uh, but it's not, it does not scale a lot. Uh, so I'm using, I'm using very few cores for the... For yeah, the because the number of atoms is too small there. So yes. the number of bits. Uh, so the, the, yeah, and other things that maybe it's important to know is uh, some, some of the variables in Zoom are parallelized. So if you know, if the most expensive part is in computing a coordination number, okay, coordination number is parallelized both on MPI and OpenMP, so it should scale well with both. But then it's, it's a bit difficult to predict exactly what will happen. So I would really recommend to do trial and errors. Okay.
Uh, and it really do it again if you go to another machine, uh, unless the architecture is the same, because it could really depend. And it could even depend on the fact that you use the GPU or not. Maybe I do the same test without the GPU, I will obtain different uh, outcome. Uh, okay, point 1D, different settings for metadynamics. I propose this and then I realized that it was actually not easy. The space of things that you can change is uh, too wide. And I also made only a few tests for this. So what I tested was uh, I tried to use uh, uh, wider hills. So, okay, first I was running a bit longer calculations because I wanted to see actually binding and unbinding between the two ions. So this test also took a bit more time. So it's one nanosecond per simulation. So this was the original choice for the width. I tried to increase it to see if I, if I could feel faster the free energy landscape. And then I look at the free energy that I obtain. They are actually, this is just, these are already projected on one direction, which is the distance between the two ions. And they are already not, uh, they are not very well converted. They do not behave as they should. They have a lot of ripples here. Maybe the simulation is still too short. And in any case, here it makes sense to count the number of transitions. So the, the blue line is the first simulation. I have one binding event. Uh, the second line, the orange line, is the second simulation. I have also one binding event. So it's not really useful to change the width. Another thing that I tried is to make the calculation 1D. So uh, instead of using distance and coordination number, use only distance. See, I changed this to B. And then here's another test where I try to restrict the domain for the distance using walls. So let's see the result. So I use the upper wall so that the distance cannot become more than 15 angstrom. So you see, this is the same length of the simulation that I had above, and I have many more binding events. So in the blue line, I already have maybe one, two, three binding events. So this is better than using two variables. So that actually means that using the coordination number is useless in this system. I was thinking about this example because uh, I, I, made, I have some experience in the past with calculation of uh, magnesium, with magnesium where really you have to break its coordination with water in order to make it bind something directly. But that, this is not happening for sodium. So sodium is too easy. On the other hand, I made some tests with magnesium before proposing this exercise and you needed simulations that were too long. And so I prefer to make the tests using sodium. Uh, so that means that for this system, sodium binds so weakly to water that it's not really necessary to enhance the, the rupture of the first coordination shell. So coordination number, the, the, the best way to optimize the coordination number calculation here is to not computing at all. Uh, okay, so, and then you see that in the orange line, if I restrict the domain to only the shorter distances, I have many more binding events. As expected, there is a, an entropic barrier to, to cross. I have to spend time exploring this region. Uh, whereas if I put the wall at 1.5, I will not spend the time. So this region is not so interesting. We will see that the free energy is, is flat there, so it, there's nothing to learn. And uh, again, even without computing errors, we know that the more events I have, the smaller the error will be. Let me show you the, the free energy profiles that I obtained. Uh, now they kind of make sense. So the the Again, there are a lot of ripples, so maybe I should make it uh, longer. Then, so the first two lines, so the, sorry, the first two lines, so the, the, I think the blue and the orange are from the calculation without the walls. The blue one is the free energy obtained with some yields. The orange is the free energy obtained with some yields plus uh, this entropic correction. So what we know is that if two particles are not interacting when they are at a large distance, or they are interacting very weakly, in this case, they would be interacting with the Coulomb interaction, but screened by the presence of water, so it's not so strong. Then the free energy as a function of the distance should not become flat, but should actually decrease as minus 2 kBT logarithm of the distance. 
That means that if I add plus two kBT times the logarithm of the distance, uh, the free energy should become flat. And you see that uh, it's not really flat, but uh, the orange line looks more flat than the blue line. It looks like the blue line is still going a bit down. We will see this better in a more converse simulation, but uh, it, it, it makes sense. And you see the same effect if you look at the calculation with the wall. So in the calculation with the wall, basically you obtain the same profile here, uh, but uh, uh, it, it stops at 1.5. So here the system never explores this region here. Then in, in the simulation, which is not restrained, you see that anyway, at 2.5, the free energy is going to increase. That's because of boundary boundary conditions. Okay, so it's less likely that the ions get at a distance which is larger than this because the distance will be computed with the minimal image convention. Uh, and it's actually, it's a waste of time to explore this region here. It's better to restrain the system so that uh, the two ions are always close to each other. Questions, comments on this? Does it make sense? Uh, one question. Yeah. Uh, I mean, from from one point, it might seem like that when you put the restraint at 1.5, then it seems kind of converged. But when you put the restraint at, at larger values, then it seems that the actual place for convergence is around 2, uh, 2 2.5. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, the, I, I think, so I didn't try. Maybe one should run longer the, the blue simulation. But uh, I think that this here, thing here, is just an artifact. It's just a statistical error. So the fact that you see this fluctuation here, it's because the blue simulation is less statistically accurate than the green one. Does it make sense? Uh, yes, yes, of course. No, but I mean, a priori, you cannot actually know that, right? It, I, I mean, you could run this, this screening at 1.5, 2, 2.5, 3, so on and so forth. And then it may seem like that you need actually a quite large uh, conformational space for actually defining an unbinding region. Okay, that, that's true. Uh, but uh, indeed, the check that I will do later with a more converse simulation is that uh, here I really see something flat. So the fact that here I have something flat, plus the fact that my understanding is that these two objects should not interact anymore when they are far from each other, uh, allows me to basically extrapolate and say that even though I not compute the energy, I don't compute the energy here, I assume it's still flat at the same value as here. So in nomine patris et filit spiriti sancti. Uh, no, uh, this is not problematic system at all, because I have only these two objects. Clearly, it could be more difficult if, for instance, you have a ligand binding on a protein, and it could bind somewhere else when the distance increases. So you have to be very careful. Okay. okay. Thank you. But uh, typically, it's sufficient to... Uh, you can also observe your simulation, uh, let's watch with BMD, and see when the ion is at that distance. Is it always non-interacting? When the ion is at, at two nanometers from the site where you would like it to bind, is it always an interacting? If so, yes. If uh, so, then so who cares about something that? Okay, and then quantitatively you can check if the profile is flat. It's difficult to say that this is flat because still the simulation is too short, but we will see in the longer simulation. Okay, thank you. Uh, another thing that I tried now, and this is really the order in which I did things, uh, is I, I, I realized that perhaps the, the initial uh, uh, width was too large. I just chose it by I, and I tried now to decrease the hill's width to half of it, and uh, uh, I see more transitions. So I, I, will, I would, in the end, I picked this as a setting for the, my longer simulation. I don't think it's a dramatic impact, but... Uh, Anyway, to me, this looked like the, the best setting I could uh, obtain. Okay, so you see here, I'm not basically anymore using the coordination number. I'm just printing it, but I'm not even showing it, so it's useless. Okay, here I have many transitions in uh, this time. That is, uh, uh, it's, uh, if I remember correctly, it's, uh, yeah, it's one nanosecond. Now I will run the simulation 10 times longer. Uh, 
Ah, okay, sorry. Here it's the calculation of the first is the calculation of the delta G. How to compute the standard binding free energy? So the standard binding free energy is defined as minus KBT times the logarithm of the probability of the system to be bound divided by the probability of the system to be unbound. But then for the unbound state, you have to take into account how much is the available volume. Because you see that the bound state uh, is always the same volume, whereas the volume of the unbound state depends, depends on the site of your box. So in order to normalize it, uh, it's conventional to divide it by, uh, uh, so divided the, this probability by the volume of the unbound state, but in order to make the units correct, it's, it's conventional to divide this by this uh, uh, V0, which is basically the volume corresponding to one mole concentration. But that's the, the standard definition of, uh, of uh, binding free energy. And uh, clearly, uh, this definition depends on something arbitrary, which is the Avogadro number and, and the definition of liter. So basically, it's just uh, uh, one liter divided by the Avogadro number uh, expressed in nanometers, which is 1.66 in nanometer to the third power, sorry, cube nanometer. OK, so what I do to compute delta G is I compute the probability of the system to be bound. This is just uh, the sum over the integral of, of the free energy up to a value equal to D bound, which I set to 0 0.4 here. Uh, and then uh, I compute the probability to be unbound with two boundaries. I choose D min and D max here. Uh, and then the volume of the unbound region is just the difference between the volume of two spheres of radius D max and D min. And that's it. And then I compute it and I obtain something like minus 2.4 in this case. That, does it make sense, this calculation? Uh, one question over there. So uh, you are putting the three the, the three elements, right? Like the weights of the bound, the weights of the unbound, and the size of the, the space of the system. Is that correct? I mean, the, the size unbound. of the unbound state. I'm defining the unbound state as a region that is distance between one and distance between 1.4 in this case. Okay. Okay. So I could use this to analyze also the simulation without the restraint. Okay. Instead of saying I correct for the volume of my simulation which is actually more difficult because it's a bit difficult to know which is the volume of your simulation when you have a box that has a, maybe a fancy shape. And you see that the free energy here is increasing because it's unlikely to have distances which are uh, this large. So uh, the easiest way is to cut a spherical shape so that it's easy to compute its volume. Okay. Uh, one could have equivalently maybe set, let's say, the max equal to infinite and then take the volume of the box maybe here. Maybe it's fine, but you have to compute the volume of the box correctly. And then it would not work if you have a, a upper wall. Okay, if you do the calculation without the upper wall, you should be able to replace this part with the volume of the box. If you do the calculation with an upper wall, Actually, approximately, you are restraining the two uh, the, the distance vector to be within a sphere of radius 1.5 nanometers. Uh, and so uh, that's the natural choice for the unbound state. But here, I'm, you see, I'm saying it's unbound only when the distance is smaller than 1.4. It's not even equal to 1.5. Okay, It's not necessarily equal. I just need to cut the portion here that is flat enough for me to be associated to the unbound state. Does it make sense? Maybe we can see the free energy profile. Okay, now, now I, I just run the same 10 times longer and analyze it in the same way. Now let's look at the free energy profile. It, it's, I, I'm just showing this because it's more converged, it's nicer, okay? Again, I have the blue line that is the fast that I obtained from some fields. 
The orange line is the same FES plus this entropic correction. And you see that here it's really flat. Okay, now I can say based on this, not based on my intuition, that when I am a distance past 0 0.75, the two ions are basically not interacting. So I could pick this region from 0 0.75 to 1.5 as an unbound region. Okay, so I can just take the probability of being here divided by the volume of this region, which is the volume of a sphere with this radius minus the volume of a sphere with this radius. I prefer not to go past this because I would have to take into account in some way the fact that I added a, an upper wall. Okay, so I, I limit the analysis to this range where actually there's, there's no bias coming from the upper wall. Does it make sense? Uh, yeah, I mean, you could always also try to rewrite the, the wall at the end, right? And yeah, but the point is that uh, uh, if you enlarge the region here, you see that something here will be completely negligible. And so you will have a lot of statistical errors. It's very inefficient to do that. As you climb up the wall, the weights increase a lot because of the wall, but you have very few samples. Okay, and that means uh, that uh, the the final result is depends a lot on these individual samples. Okay. Okay. Then of course you need to be in a condition such that you can define this flat region. Otherwise, you cannot do this. It could be more complicated if you have if you are, for instance, looking at binding of ions on a, on a bigger molecule, bigger than another ion, let's say, and maybe with some complicated shape. So, but it's possible to use tricks to define well regions that can be considered as bulk. And you always have to make sure that they are the, the particle, the, the atom there are, is really behaving as a the ion is really behaving as an ion in the bulk. So the free energy in this case is flat. Okay, then this was just a dummy check to check if this was depending on, on the choice of the mean. It was not very much depending, but uh, yeah, these numbers are all similar to each other. Okay, uh, let me go <clears throat> to the final point that the computing error, statistical error for this. So uh, first, Instead of, so this was like a quick calculation that I did uh, just uh, post-processing my yields uh, with some yields and so on. But uh, in the end, I always try to compute the final numbers using reweighting because to me it's more uh, reliable. Some yields sometimes introduce some uh, artifact due to the tails of the Gaussians that are a bit difficult to <coughs> detect. And so I prefer to just use reweighting. Uh, here, what I did, uh, I reweight, I, I read the Hills file as if it was a trajectory file in order to know the value of the collective variable that were visited. You have seen this already in some other exercise. And then I compute the bias from meta D, and I also compute the bias from the walls, but uh, uh, it's actually not necessary. You see, it's always zero, except when you are above distance 1.5, that uh, is not uh, interesting here. Uh, so I just uh, recompute this as usual with a large weight, i zero, just to compute the bias. And uh, I read it here. Uh, and then here I have time series, distance, and uh, bias. And uh, I assign a weight equal to the exponential of the bias divided by KBT. And then I compute uh, delta G using this time series of uh, distances. Now I'm using the actual distance and not the histogram of the distance evaluated with this sort of kernel density that uh, is a sum of Gaussians that you do with meta analysis. So uh, this is really the, the, the distance. And this is the weight computed from the exponential of the potential. And it's the same calculation as above. And uh, I obtain a value here, which is significantly smaller, actually, because this calculation is, I would say, is much more trustable than the one above. It's much longer, and there is this, this thing that is uh, more reliable of doing reweighting rather than using some heels. And then I did the block bootstraps. 
bootstrap, uh, I just uh, divided my trajectory in 10 blocks. I didn't make a careful check for, for uh, how many blocks are needed, but uh, you might remember we have a lot of binding events, so this should not be a problem. So I use 10 blocks. And then I use Bootstrap to pick with, uh, to extract 10 blocks from the 10 blocks and to recompute the standard free edge of binding with the uh, different subsets of the trajectory. And uh, this is the average that I obtained, very close to the value I obtained from the full entire trajectory. And this is the error. So that means that the final value is, is something very small. Uh, with an error that is actually bigger than the value itself. So the standard binding free energy here is very close to zero. Actually, the, the value zero for a standard binding free energy has no particular physical meaning because it arbitrarily depends on our definition of the molar volume for the, for the normalization. Uh, but, uh, but still, yeah, it, this means that my standard binding free energy, it's likely between, I don't know, minus 0. Uh, uh, 4 and uh, plus 0 0.2 kJ per mole. And that's it. Questions, comments? So how many of you managed to arrive? So maybe Oliver was the one asking questions. So did you arrive up to the end? Um, no, I, I had some troubles with uh, reweighting to uh, standard conditions. <laughs> okay. Well, what was the problem? Uh, well, I was trying to understand um, the, the formulas on how to, um, yeah, basically on how to do that conversion. I see. Is it clear now? Um, it's a bit clear, but still not fully clear. <laughs> but I think I have some uh, reading to do as well. <laughs> okay, so reading. maybe maybe you can try to do it on your, on your data, and uh, and then just uh, so think about it, and then you can ask questions on Slack on the Slack channel if you want. Okay, perfect. Or if you have other question now, just ask. Uh, uh, so... No, sorry. Hey, go ahead. <laughs> No, 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 you can ask. I have no further questions. <laughs> uh, no, I, I just wanted to ask uh, how would it be if you actually had two ligands on the on the system? Uh, what do you mean two ligands? Uh, two copies of the same or two different ligands? Uh, for example, one... Uh, one in, the, in this case, let's say that you have two ions in that yeah. case. Yeah, but two ligands binding on two different sites, you mean? Uh, no, for example, two ligands binding on the on the similar site, we would be the the concentration would technically be different, right? What do you mean the concentration will be different? So I you mean, mean in your simulation you have two different ligands <laughs> simultaneously, so they compete. Yep. Okay. So you also have to take into account that the effect of competition. Because you can compute the probability to bind one when the other is bound, which is likely zero if they compete for the same site. And so the probability to bind one will be affected by the fact that the other one is bound. So, yeah, okay. so you have to be a bit careful. Maybe to do this kind of analysis and compute the binding affinity for uh, each of them, you should uh, conditionally you, you just extract statistics assuming uh, using only frames when one of them is not bound, you compute the affinity of the other one. Oh, okay. Okay, but then you need to model in some way the fact that maybe in the real experiment that they are both present at different concentrations and they compete. And clearly the one with the higher affinity will bind more likely, displacing the other one. Uh, actually, the one with the higher affinity and higher concentration with mine more likely. I don't know if the answer makes sense. Uh, no, but I mean, it was also my question. So I think it's, uh, it's, it's fine that part. Maybe I will try to, to write something in Slack about this. Okay. Thank okay. you. Okay, uh, other questions or comments? Okay, if not, I will just stop sharing uh, and leave the stage to Max. Okay.
Can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so we move to exercise two now. Did you, uh, anybody try to solve it or complete it? Nobody. I've tried the very beginning, but not the rest. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, it's not a problem. We, we will, we will uh, correct, we will do it together. Uh, if you were present to the masterclass four, where we talk about metadynamics, you are familiar with this example. is um, is a nice biological system, and it's the C terminal domain of a virus factor. And the nice thing is that this uh, um, system undergoes a conformational change between this uh, alpha helical state A, when is uh, let's say interacting with the this other part of the of the protein uh, to a beta uh, let's say beta sheet uh, rich conformation here on the right. So we want to study this conformational change, um, and uh, to do this uh, we use a kind of a, a simplified representation of the system. So we we are not using an explicit solvent or latent simulation, but we are using what is called a structure based potential, and this structure based potential is a uh, uh, as, as the name uh, suggests, is uh, based on the knowledge of one of more structures that your system uh, can populate. So the energy function that is used is designed in order to have a minimum in the known, a local minima in the known structures of your system. Um, so to do this, the uh, scoring, the energy function, sorry, uh, promotes what are called native contacts. So interaction between atoms that are present in uh, one or two or three of your reference states. Um, in this exercise, uh, we are focusing um, on these two states. So you have uh, in, in the GitHub account, uh, uh, of this masterclass, you can you, you have uh, two PDB files if you want to have a look uh, again uh, and examine the beta bar and the alpha helical states, uh, and you have all the topology file, the TPR file to run the simulation with Chromax. So the idea is that uh, in, in masterclass four, we try uh, you 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 try to design a collective variable in order to announce the. Uh, transition between these two states. Uh, and we tried, uh, if you remember the RMSD with respect to state A and state B, and they were kind of good uh, uh, collective variable. Um, here we examine another collective variable, which is uh, quite good when you have this structure-based potential, which is uh, a variable that counts the number of native contacts that are formed in, in, at any time in your simulation. This is a good variable for this simplified potential between, because it is highly correlated with the energy of the system. And the energy is a, a function of a, of a native contact. So we want to design this collective variable and, and optimize it. And, and in the um, GitHub repository, I shared a sample uh, pruned input file that wants to, to, to count the number of native contacts, uh, focusing, I think, just on the uh, beta barred state. So we want just to announce the sampling with respect to the beta barred state and see if we can also visit the other state in the meantime. Um, OK, so let's have a look at the, uh, at the proposed input file, which is very inefficient. And uh, uh, the thing that I'm doing here, uh, the first, uh, I'm uh, reconstructing the system uh, by fixing this continuity due to periodic boundary conditions. The system is very small, it's just 330 atoms. So I reconstruct the whole system with this whole molecular instruction and I give a list of all the atoms of the system. Uh, then I define two variables which are useful for monitoring the simulation, which are the RMSD, which with respect to state A and the RMSD with respect to state B. So we will not optimize this variable, we just keep them to, to monitor uh, the simulation. Now we start defining the variable for metadynamic simulation. And to do this, I provided a list of 379 distances, which are the distances between atoms that are closer than I think six angstrom in the reference PDB file, which is state A. Um, so you will have now, I, here you have just three of them, but if you open the actual plumed input file, there are 379 uh, lines. Each one is a distance between two atoms. 
And since we reconstruct the system, uh, uh, we have no discontinuity due to PBC. We, we are ignoring the PBC for the calculation of all the variables that, that, that we have in this input file. Okay, once we have calculated the distances, we need to define a contact. And to define a contact, we, we want a function of the distance that basically is uh, equal to one when the distance is uh, lower of, of, of the order of uh, six and strong. And we want this function to, to go to zero uh, as the distance increases. And um, so I decided that there are many ways to, to do this. We, and Giovanni sh showed a page of a switching function in, in Plumed. Some are already there, nat natively implemented. Here we want to try something more exotic, which is uh, um, this function is, uh, is based on the error function. So for each distance, I define a contact between two atoms, which is one minus the error function of the distance to the fourth power. And again, this is not periodic. If you don't believe me, this is how this uh, switching function should look like. So the, the contacts are based on uh, six, a six angstrom cutoff. So in a six angstrom, this uh, switching function is uh, 0 0.9, 0 0.85. So it's, it, it means it's, it's formed, this contact. And then it decreases slowly to zero, around 10, 12 angstrom, this switching function is, 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 is uh, basically zero. So this is the way we estimate one contact. And again, we do this 379 times to define all the contacts between the pairs of atoms, so the native contacts. Then what we need to do is to sum all these uh, uh, contribution to define the total number of native contacts. And to do this, there is a, um, there is a, an action in Plume, which is called combine, but may, basically it allows you any polynomial expression uh, of a predefined collective variable. Here you have, uh, let's say, if, if you look at the manual, there are other, so this is the functional form. And uh, what you can specify is, uh, um, a prefactor and, uh, and the exponent. And by default, the prefactor is one and the exponent is one. So if you just define a list of, uh, for example, here of collective variable, what uh, combine does is just to sum them. This is the default behavior, but you can change it by assigning different powers. So different P or different uh, coefficients. So here, since there are no other definitions, what it's doing is simply summing these 379 uh, contacts. And this gives the CV, which is the CV that we will use for metadynamics. So we need, as usual, to define our metadynamics uh, part of the input file with the pace for the Gaussian deposition, an initial high, and a bias factor. The bias factor here, I suggested in somewhere in the instruction to use a very high bias factor because we are simulating at a temperature that is a bit unphysical due to the nature of this force field. So I think the simulation is at, at around 50 or 60 Kelvin, and there are some high barriers that we need to, to, to pass. So the bias factor should take into account, should, should be large to take into account these barriers and the temperature of the system. And then uh, here I pre-selected a certain value of sigma that we, you might want to optimize it, as Giovanni did for the uh, previous example. And that's it. As you can see here, we are not, we are not using any, any grids to start with. So this is the uh, input file that I provided, which is extremely efficient. Now we will test it and we will try to, to optimize it. So let's go to the notebook. I think I, I, I need to do this with you. So this is, uh, uh, we have used a variation of these multiple times. So we have to import some module and, and set the path to this exercise. And the first thing that, uh, that I did already, so I, I pre-run all the simulation because they take some time. The first thing that we want to check is uh, how efficient is Gromax alone when we don't use Plumed, how efficient is on this system. And again, this system is smaller. Uh, so we, I'm not expecting to scale uh, more than two or four uh, cores. And here, the machine that I'm using, I reported here the um, specifics as uh, 16 physical cores, and uh, um, which are pretty good, and one GPU, which is, uh, let's say, not, not super recent. I think it has four, five, or six years. 
but it still is, is working nicely. So we create a subdirectory for this first test and we run a very short uh, simulation. This I think is a, a few seconds because again, the cost of this force field is, is, uh, this force is very cheap. So we can do many steps in a short period of time. And then after doing this, I extract the performances of, a, of a Chrome alone. You, Giovanni showed one way here is a very simple bash command that just grab from the output file how many nanoseconds you can do per day. So as you can see, you can do almost 800 nanoseconds per day, which is a good thing on one side, this, but it's, uh, it's less good is if you think now, we have to add, uh, uh, define some collective variable, do metadynamics. So since the phosphate is so cheap, uh, there is a chance that the, the, the cost of plume is very high. And, and this happens from time to time. Okay, so we, we measure the performance of Gromax alone. And now I take this uh, very inefficient input file and I try to measure the decrease in performances when I use this input file. So basically, I, 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 I pasted this input file in, in this file plume.dat that you will find in the GitHub anyway. And I, I do exactly the same thing for, for, uh, for the same length. And then let's say I will give you just the end of the file. As you can see now, we pass from 700 and more nanoseconds to 15 nanoseconds per day. So the impact of plume is pretty dramatic to calculate this uh, uh, collective variable. And you can see here, this is the simplified uh, breakdown of, uh, of the cost, but there's not much more that we are doing apart from the RMSD calculation, but this is done every, I think, 500 steps. Yes, so every 500 steps, I'm also calculating the RMSD. What might cost a little bit uh, is uh, this action, which is all molecules. So we have to reconstruct the system and this is an expense that we are not monitoring uh, for the moment. You can do, if you, if you print out the detailed timing, you can also identify what is the cost of, uh, of the whole molecule action. But for the moment, we focus just on the, uh, how to optimize this corrective variable. Okay, so let's proceed. So nobody tried to, to write an optimized version of this variable, if I understood correctly. So do you have any idea how we can do this in a more efficient way? Using the coordination function. Okay. And how can I, because here I specified a, a specific function, how can I do this with coordination? I think in the coordination, you can also choose which, which switching function you want to use. Even if it's not defined in uh, native in Plume? <clears throat> there are, uh, well, one can define custom switching function. Perfect. This is what we will uh, use. Uh, and this simplifies a lot the input file, but, but instead of writing 1000 lines, we, we write uh, very fewer lines and it's also more efficient. So here, what I wrote, so we still need to reconstruct the molecule and we still want to calculate the RMSD, but then we substitute this long list of distances and, and, uh, and individual contact with just one variable, which is a coordination. And this is slightly different with respect to what Giovanni did. So Giovanni specified two groups of atoms, and then the coordination is one group with respect to all the atoms of the other group. Here we define what is called, uh, we add an option, which is called pair, which means it's just considered uh, the corresponding atoms in this list. For example, only atom one and 110 uh, will be uh, considered as neighbor. And, and the switching function will be calculated between only these two atoms and one and 115, one and 122. So this is really the, what I did is very simple. I just take the first atoms of each distances here and I, and I put it here as group A, this is one way to do it. And then the second atoms becomes group B. So they are, they, I am keeping the, the, let's say the, um, correspondence between the two atoms because I'm using this pair option. So it's not calculating all against all coordination. Is it clear this point? 
hopefully yes yes perfect and then i as you said i can define a switching function which is basically whatever i want so it's a custom function and i i, I exactly use the definition that uh, that i use in the non-optimized version of the, the input file so for the moment this is uh, not really interesting this r0 because it's not used anymore but i think it's needed somehow okay so this should be formally identical to the function that uh, um, uh, i'm using in the other uh, non-optimized file but we will check this of course so there is a nice thing of plume that uh, uh, of course it, it implements uh, it, you can use whatever you want as a, as a functional form and automatically you will have derivatives with respect to this functional form and uh, uh, so this part is uh, basically should be okay and then uh, I think I'm not uh, changing parameters here of the metadynamics is still without any grid and uh, with uh, this value that I propose for sigma. The only thing that I want to do here is uh, do a quick uh, run and, and check if we improved something in the calculation of the in the performances. So let's do this. So this was pre-calculated. As, as you can see, the, the cost of uh, calculating the variable decreased significantly. So this was the cost, total cost, and this is the cost for, uh, for each call. And so we are, we are improving by, by order of magnitude. And the total uh, simulation time increased from 50 nanoseconds to 317. So this is a huge gain in using this, uh, um, this uh, formulation of exactly the same collective variable. But we want to check this. So what I did is something very, very simple. These are two independent runs that at a certain point they will diverge. But hopefully the, uh, what we check is the first frame. So at least this should be identical. So I'm just uh, looking at the first line because we start from exactly the same conformation. The first line is the non-optimized variable. This is the, the, the value of the total number of contacts. And this is uh, with the optimized variable. As you can see, at least for this conformation and hopefully for, for the others, the two variables are identical. It's just that one is way more efficient than the other. Questions? OK. Now we have, uh, let's say, something that works uh, decently well. And what we want to do is uh, to um to do a production run a metadynamics production run and uh, to do this uh, i switch on for the moment the use of grids for metadynamics and i will show the effect of this choice later on when we have accumulated many gaussians so here is for me is very simple the the range of uh, of the of the grid because the number of contacts uh, you remember the number of pairs maximum was 379 so there's no way this variable will be higher than 379 uh, so you can put actually 380 here it's, it's fine uh, but i just put 400 and, uh, and uh, i'm i am sure that this is more than enough for what is needed uh, in the in the simulation and then I adjust a little bit the Gaussian width, and this is uh, again trials and error, but the, even the initial choice were, were fine. Um, so basically that's it, and I'm running here, uh, there is not the length, but I think around 15 nanoseconds. It takes some time because it's, it's not an, an easy exercise, as it seems. Uh, so basically here is just to prepare and run the simulation. There's nothing really to do because it's done already. And now we proceed and, uh, and we look at uh, what is produced. As, as usual, you can import your, your Colver uh, in output file when you have the value of the number of contacts, the RMSD and the bias into a Pandas uh, data frame. And you can plot uh, the evolution, for example, of the total number of contacts during the simulation. Okay, so this is, yes, it's, it's more or less 50 nanoseconds, a little bit more. Here you have simulation time versus total number of contact, native contacts. If you remember, the starting conformation were, was around 50, 56 contacts. So it should be sometime he, here. So what you can see is that rapidly 
you, you arrived at a very large number of contacts, around 350, and then you go back to almost zero native contact, and you have some, uh, let's say, um, nice diffusion in this space of native concepts. Still, you don't know if you, you're, you're reaching your state A and your state B. And this is why uh, it, it most likely is the case, because you have a, a, a large number of native contacts, but it's always better to, um, to look at the RMSD with respect to the two states. So this is what I'm actually doing. I, I still have my data frame here in memory. Um, so I'm looking, here we go. I, I'm looking at the number of native contact versus the RMD from state A. So these native contacts were extracted from state A. So it, I expect a, a um, um, high correlation between the CV of metadynamics on the X axis and the RMD from state A. And this is basically the case because when, when you have a large number of native contacts, the RMSD in here is nanometer is very is very very low. I think you arrive up to 0.1 Enstrong, even even better, um, even lower uh, with respect to the United States. As the number of contacts decreases, uh, the RMSD uh, increase. So this is uh, pretty nice, nicely correlated with the RMSD. Um, that we use in another exercise. And now I want to also to monitor what happened if during the simulation, now I know that I'm visiting the one of the two structures, the state A, which is also the most populated. I want to see if I'm also visiting uh, state B, for which I didn't provide any native contact in the, in the definition of my CV. Maybe there are some that are shared between state A and B, but uh, this is not necessarily true. So what I'm doing here, I'm plotting now native contact versus RMSD from state B. As you can see, when you have a large number of native contacts, you are very far uh, away from state B. You are 10 Enstrom RMSD. But there is a point where you have formed, when you have formed around 50, 60 native contacts that you are close to state B. So indeed, there are some contacts that are shared between state A and state B. And the, uh, we are able also to, to explore and to reach state B. And, and uh, ju just we keep in mind that state B in this variable, in this CV, is located around uh, 60 or 70 uh, native contacts. Is it clear what, I'm, what we are doing? OK. Yep. Perfect. So this seems to be a good variable. It's not. It's able to 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 push the system repeatedly from state A uh, to visit state A. Uh, now we want to check more quantitatively, um, as we have done in, in other exercises, uh, the uh, meta the convergence of the metadynamic simulation. And the first thing that I want to check is the estimate of the free energy. And here we used. Uh, the Gaussian that we have deposited during the simulation. And if you remember, the first thing to check is your estimate of the free energy as a function of the simulation time. So I'm using the sum is command, and I'm, uh, in, let's say, printing an estimate of the free energy every 10,000 uh, Gaussian. And I'm aligning all the profiles to add the minimum values to zero. And this is convenient for visualization. This was quick. Uh, so now I have, I think, around, let's see, 20, 20, 22 files. I'm printing just the end, so it's clearer. The last few profiles. At, uh, so you see you have a total of 220,000 Gaussian deposited. But you see that toward the end, these profiles are not significantly changing. You have a, uh, the, the minimum. Uh, at a large value of native contact. So this is uh, your state A, and we knew that it was more, uh, more populated than the other state. And the state B that we, uh, we have seen uh, before should be around here. There's not really a clear minimum in, in, in this free energy, but we know that it's located around here. So this is nice. I think I'd, if this were a real application, I would, I would uh, stop my simulation and start a more uh, um, a more accurate analysis of the error in the free energy and the convergence. And we have done this multiple times. So I, I, I will go quickly here. And uh, as Giovanni said, it's, it's, it's 
the first thing to do is to calculate the method and the, the reweighting to reweight the simulation to calculate the weight of each conformation. And we can do this by recycling the old plumed input file. I'm calling it plumed reweight, but it's basically the same except for a few things. So we, we just restart the old calculation. So we read the, the, the Gaussian that, that, that have been deposited and we don't uh, add new Gaussians. So the only thing to do here, hopefully this is correct, yes. So we are in the same directory as we executed this, uh, the simulation. The only thing to take in, into account is the temperature of the system, which is uh, uh, not the usual 2.5 uh, kJ per mole, but it's much lower, lower. So what we do now is to calculate, it should be pretty fast, so we, we analyze the trajectory and we recalculate the, the in this case, just the, the value of the CV and the bias potential. This is done. And now I think you know very well what you, what you need to do. And Giovanni showed for a fixed value of the dimension of the block, uh, what is the error? Here I'm doing the full block analysis, uh, a bit manual, manual with oak. And, and I create a, a file with a, value of the CV and the weight. And this, as usual, is assuming that the bias potential is constant throughout the simulation. So I apply this uh, uh, correction, which is the exponent, uh, exponential of the bias divided by KBT. And then I try from different block sizes, uh, calculate the error, the, the typical error along the profile. And so this is exactly what we did uh, in a previous exercise. And this should take uh, a few seconds. So uh, I hope it's not confusing because you have seen doing the reweighting part in two or three different ways, but using basically the same formula. Also, this part can be done uh, in a plumed, uh, using a plumed input file. And I think Garrett especially uh, used, used this approach. But here I'm using really the raw data that we produced before. And I'm, I'm, so you, maybe you can see one more time the formulas that we, that we use. Uh, Max. Yes. I cannot hear you. Go ahead, go ahead. You have to switch on the microphone. Yeah, it's done. So uh, just one question about it. So I was thinking, and um, when you're doing this, uh, this coordination, this pairwise coordination stuff, you are using a CV that is a little bit uh, biased in the sense that you are forcing the system to follow one step. Shouldn't it just, I was just thinking a little bit on site, outside, why don't you use a single, a simple coordination number just to explore the, the whole space instead of actually trying to pair in already known contacts? That can, that can be done, yes. I'm cheating a little bit because I'm using, we are cheating in any case because we are using a potential energy function which is based on the knowledge of the structure. So we know the structure. And uh, because you design the energy to do, to do this. So I'm cheating again uh, and, uh, and I'm using just these contacts that I, I know are formed in the global minimum or in the local minimum of this function. But you can try with a, a more generic coordination at this point. So in all against all or just the C alpha, at this point, probably you will have uh, even more pairs and you, you have to use three, the tricks that Giovanni showed you. So the neighbor listing and other optimization. Here you, you, have, uh, you have no neighbor list because you know exactly uh, what to look. Um, so yes, you, you, can, you can try, it's a good exercise. Okay, thank you. And about the error function, why did we choose that one? Because I mean, it was not implemented, uh, because I like it, it was, it's, it's, uh, and it was not implemented natively in Plumbed. So, and the, the reason is that we use the, to accelerate the calculation of this custom function, we use a library, which is called, uh, I reported here, and I always forget the name, uh, ASM JIT. So this uh, allow to calculate efficiently with custom switching function, but it must be enabled during the um, compilation of Plumed. So you have to click here to see how to enable the use of this library, which makes calculation faster. What I, I, I will show you later is uh, the difference in performance if you use uh, this library or not. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So perfect. Uh, in the meantime, the, error, the block analysis was finished. 
So what we usually do is look at the error as a function of the block size. Maybe it's not perfectly converged, but you see that is he is trying is basically reaching a, a nice plateau and it start to be noisy. Uh, so we are not really very far from a, from from a convergence. And B gives you also the average error along the one dimensional free energy profile. This is exactly what we did in masterclass four. Uh, but this tells us also that this uh, um, simulation is converged. Uh, so uh, what we what I what, we, what I would like to sh to show you now is the so we will converge to our simulation then we will compare the results and this simulation are uh, run using what Giovanni introduced last week which is the multiple time stepping. Uh, so instead of uh, uh, calculating the uh, the force at every step of the simulation, we do this with a certain stride. Of, and this, of course, introduce is an approximation, introduce some error. Uh, so we want to first try how much the performances are changing with this multiple time stepping and keep an eye on the error by monitoring uh, this uh, drift in ineffective energy, which is calculated by Klund. And Giovanni explained in the theoretical lecture how this uh, is, um, can be used to monitor if the choice of the stride is, is correct. So we will run two other very long simulation, I mean, four or five hours each one, uh, one with a stride two, and we add this uh, line to uh, print on this colvar ene, ene uh, the uh, effective energy, so we, we will monitor its drift. And the second simulation, stride four, uh, same thing with stride four. So here I don't have to do anything. Basically, it's, it's already run. And here with the stride four. Okay. Uh, the first thing that I would like to check is the um, performances with the original uh, metadynamic simulation with stride one and the, the this new latest simulation. And I, I do this uh, with a simple grab command. So the first one is with stride one, and it's around 322, which is of the order of what we see before. It's just a longer simulation and with the grids. Uh, with stride two, there is a, a little gain in the performances. It's not really dramatic, but there is a little gain. With stride four, I would say no, not at all. You're not gaining anything. So it seems already stride two could be a good compromise. But what we need to check, what we need to look at is the drift in this effective energy. And so, uh, and this is printed in this call bar in it. Fine, so I'm, I'm loading the two data sets, uh, data frame, and I'm plotting them together here. So as you can see, uh, the behavior is very different. In blue, you have a stride two, which seems to be a bit more well behaved than stride four, which is kind of going, uh, it's not dramatic probably, and I don't have an absolute threshold to tell you this is good or this is not good drift, but it's clearly uh, drifting more than, than the one with stride two. The thing that you we, we want to check is also at the end of the simulation, uh, at convergence, how different are the free energies? If you remember the slide from Giovanni, he showed the example of uh, uh, RNA, I don't remember, it was uh, the biochemical energy in RNA. Uh, and if you remember the free energy for different choices of a side, at a certain point, they were, they were completely different. And so this is what we want to do now. And believe me that they are, for the moment, that they are all free converged. We know that one is converged, but also the other, uh, uh, two are converged, so I'm just comparing the final free energy, let's say at the end of the simulation, calculated from the uh, metadynamics bias potential. So this will take one second, and what we will do is to uh, compare them. Do you have questions regarding the um, multiple time stepping? I mean, no, it seems bad. And that, that might be my take key, my main takeaway, right? Like this one, the orange one. Yep. 
it seems bad. Let's see if it's dramatic. The effect on the final free energy is dramatic. Uh, let's see. So it's done the calculation so I can compare the final free energies. Okay, here we go. Um, in blue is this with stride one, in orange stride two, which is pretty similar with stride one, and stride four, I think, is clearly different from the other two. So there are two indications here, the stride four maybe is too much, the energy drift and the fact that free energy is, uh, deviates significantly from, uh, um, from the other two. So I would say in normal application, probably you don't converge a full simulation um, before saying, well, let's choose stride one and you just look at the, you run a preliminary simulation, you just look at the drift and how it changed with the stride. So I just to convince you that it's correct what we are finding, this is uh, from master class four and we converged uh, and the uh, two-dimensional metadynamic simulation using the RMSD from state A and the RMSD from state B as variable. And we found two minima. The most populated was state A, so this one. And then there was this little state here, which is actually uh, state B, the alpha helical state. And this was around 20 something K joule per mole. So it's in the blue green area here with respect to this and this is more or less what we are finding here because you remember the state the b was located at uh, around 50 so the difference between this one and this one it's it's of the let's say qualitatively the right uh, uh, value so green side four is clearly wrong and it's inconsistent with this previous simulation that you did. Okay, so this is nice. So at least we, we managed to converge with simulation. It took me five or six hours to run this, five hours maybe. Um, but it could have been much longer if I didn't use the grid. And I want to show you uh, how much longer would have been. So here, basically what I'm doing is I'm restarting a simulation. I'm using the optimized variable here. So here is only one line, but it's, it's the same variable. Exactly the same thing. I'm restarting the simulation and I read the Gaussian from our previous run, the one with the grids. So it accumulates 220,000 Gaussians. It reads all of them and then it, it continues the simulation without the grids. And I'm continuing this for, uh, uh, I think, one hour. And so we do this, it's done. And then we can compare the performances. Uh, and here I'm comparing three runs and I will show you why. Okay, so the second, let's, let's start from the, sorry, from the first one. The first one was our first test of uh, a few steps of, uh, of metadynamics without the grids. And it was okay, the performance. It was 317 nanoseconds. Then we did the second run much longer, five, six hours with the grid. And the performance was pretty nice, 322 uh, nanoseconds. Using these two, these, the Gaussian deposited in the second run, we restarted the third run without the grid. And you see that the performance are, uh, uh, um, are, are completely killed by, by reading and, uh, this long list of Gaussian calculated 200,000 exponential uh, function at each MD time steps. So the, the first uh, timing show you that in the beginning, it doesn't matter if you use grids or not because the performance are, are pretty good. But once you accumulate enough Gaussian, the using the grid makes a, a huge difference. Is it clear? And I think this is a, is a very clear example that you need the proof that you need to use the grid. Questions? We are almost at the end. There are two little things to show you. Okay. The thing I was mentioning before is the calculation of these custom uh, switching function in the coordination is uh, 
um, made efficient, a little bit efficient by the use of this library. So what I want to show you is how much is uh, this effect. So what you can do is running, for example, the simulation with the grid, but disabling the use of this library. You can do it. You don't need to recompile the code. To, you need to compile the code to use the library. And it's explained here at the end of this. Uh, here. So to make uh, this lepton library, which is the one for custom switching function faster, you, you need to enable this other library at the compilation stage. And this library is provided uh, since Plume 2.6 in inside Plume, so you don't have to download uh, anything uh, new. You just need to enable it. And if you want to switch it off just to test uh, during the simulation, you can uh, tell Plume before running the simulation, which is exactly what I tried before, what I tried here. So, okay, switching off this. Uh, Library, as you can see, the, the performances are, are decreasing a little bit. So it's important also to, if you use this custom function, to enable uh, the ASMGIT library. Well, I think this is all the things that I, that I tried this week, and I kind of summarize it here. Uh, the first one is the performance of Gromax alone, which is super efficient uh, the, um, on this system. Uh, the original input file that I provide is terrible, so you, you won't be able to, to do anything in one week and solve the exercise, so you need to optimize it uh, using coordination and custom functions. So you gain a little bit with stride uh, equal to two for metadynamics, uh, not, not much, but it's worth uh, uh, trying. Certainly, you don't gain much with stride four, and also you get the wrong free energy, so no way to use it. The performance, if you don't use the grid, are really, really, really bad after a while, not in the beginning, but after a couple of hours of simulation already, the performances are, are terrible. And uh, also, if you don't use this uh, uh, library to accelerate calculation of custom function, you, you lose a little bit. So just for fun, uh, all these, these custom switching functions are defined in the plume into file, and they use these libraries. Uh, I try to implement natively in C++ in the coordination, uh, let's say, uh, CV in Plumed, this specific switching function, the error function, to see if we can go even faster if we add a native implementation, uh, which is this uh, last uh, part, the violet, and you gain a little bit. I think the performance is almost 400 uh, uh, nanoseconds per day, but still is a... Uh, is, uh, it gives a lot of flexibility with the custom function and the, the, the efficiency is, is, is pretty good. So this is done as far as exercise two is concerned. I have a question for you. I don't know if you noticed one thing in this bar plot. But still you are, you're, you're, you're losing a lot of performances with respect to Gromax alone. And um, one, the, the thing that, that we are not monitoring are two. One is the cost of reconstructing the periodic boundary condition with all molecules. And I invite you, if you want, to, to try to, to detect how much these are costing. But also, there is uh, one thing to, to take into account uh, that there is a uh, uh, some sharing of information between Gromax and, uh, and Plumed. And in this case, since the code is so efficient, this sharing of information, which are the position at every uh, step of the MD, might slow down the simulation um, a little bit. So even if we just ask for the position and we don't do much, that probably there will be a, a, a slowdown in the performances of uh, Gromax, even if we don't calculate the coordination. Okay. So I think this is uh, all for exercise two and for this uh, um, lecture. Let me switch out the screen sharing. And uh, if you want, I can uh, interrupt 